Uh, hello friends, thank you for joining our study. Uh, I just want to say thank you to the Baha'i Administration. Uh, please know that this is actually a personal interpretation. It is my opinion and my understanding of the Baha'i Writings. Uh, for an official view, please actually refer to the Baha'i Writings themselves and jump over to Baha'i.org. Uh, in the description below, you're going to find an MP3 version of this talk, uh, a PDF with all the quotes that are actually being used, and as well, timestamps of the different sections of the talk, so you can always jump ahead or get back to where you were before. And if for any reason you would like to be alerted of upcoming videos, uh, please click subscribe. And so in this section, uh, titled The Manifestation in All the Worlds, we're going to begin with one quote from Baha'u'llah. O oh, people! I swear by the one true God. This is the ocean out of which all seas have proceeded, and with which every one of them will ultimately be united. From him all the sons have been generated, and unto him they will all return. Through his potency the trees of divine revelation have yielded their fruits, every one of which has been sent down in the form of a prophet, bearing a message to God's creatures in each of the worlds whose number God alone, in his all-encompassing knowledge, can reckon." This quote clearly states that a message has been sent to each of the worlds of God in the form of a prophet. That every single world of God, which are infinite, receives a message from the Divine in the form of a manifestation of God. This next quote is from Abdu'l-Bahá. What is he in need of in the kingdom, which transcends the life and limitation of this mortal sphere? That world beyond is a world of sanctity and radiance. Therefore, it is necessary that in this world he should acquire these divine attributes. In that world there is a need of spirituality, faith, assurance, the knowledge and love of God. These he must attain in this world so that after his ascension from the earthly to the heavenly kingdom, he shall find all that is needful in that eternal life ready for him." We can see in some sense why now that Abdu'l-Bahá says that we are in need, uh, in need of faith and assurance in all the worlds of God, why these characteristics actually have to be developed here in this life and are needed in the next life, because in the next life there will be a manifestation of God in that world. In fact, as we've just heard from Baha'u'llah, in every single world. And since there can be no tie of direct intercourse to bind the one true God with his creation, and no resemblance whatever can exist between the transient and the eternal, the contingent and the absolute, he hath ordained that in every age and dispensation a pure and stainless soul be made manifest in the kingdoms of earth and heaven. Led by the light of unfailing guidance, and invested with supreme sovereignty, they are commissioned to use the inspiration of their words, the effusions of their infallible grace, and the sanctifying breeze of their revelation, for the cleansing of every longing heart and receptive spirit from the dross and dust of earthly cares and limitations. From the foregoing passages and allusions, it has been made indubitably clear that in the kingdoms of earth and heaven there must needs be manifested a being, an essence who shall act as a manifestation and vehicle for the transmission of the grace of the divinity itself, the sovereign Lord of all. Through the teachings of this day star of truth, every man will advance and develop until he attaineth the station at which he can manifest all the potential forces with which his inmost true self hath been endowed." So once again in this quote, it actually states that in the kingdoms of earth and heaven there needs to be a manifestation of God. Why? Because there can be no direct intercourse, and that it is necessary that a being can act as the vehicle or the transmission of God's grace and divinity itself in all the worlds of God. To man, the essence of God is incomprehensible. So also are the worlds beyond this, and their condition. It is given to man to obtain knowledge, to attain to great spiritual perfection, 
to discover hidden truths and to manifest even the attributes of God. But still man cannot comprehend the essence of God. Where the ever-widening circle of man's knowledge meets the spiritual world, a manifestation of God is sent to mirror forth his splendor. So in this quote from Abdu'l-Baha, we're told that there are spiritual worlds beyond this one, and that they are, if you will, blocked off from us. We're unable to directly access them. And whenever the ever-widening circle of man's knowledge meets the spiritual world, a manifestation of God is sent to mirror forth his splendor. So in, if we look at the world as being a series of successive layers, successive levels of creation, successive levels of reality, we see that whenever we are actually separate from that one which is above us, this necessitates a vehicle for the transmission of God's infinite grace and for a divinity itself into that world in the form of a prophet. And should anyone inscribe with true faith but one letter of that revelation, his recompense would be greater than for inscribing all the heavenly writings of the past and all that had been written during previous dispensations. Likewise, continue thou to ascend through one revelation after another, knowing that thy progress in the knowledge of God shall never come to an end, even as it can have no beginning. In this quote he says, Likewise, continue thou to ascend through one revelation after another, knowing that the progress in the knowledge of God shall never come to an end. So the progress of our soul in approaching God and coming to know Him will never end, and we continue to ascend through each of these worlds. What's fascinating here is that the Bob actually says we continue to ascend through one revelation after another. So if we begin to look at this, we have these multiple infinite layers of God, or sorry, infinite layers of worlds. Within each of these worlds there is a manifestation of God, and we ascend through each of these worlds as we ascend through each of these revelations. We will have experience of God's Spirit through His prophets in the next world, but God is too great for us to know without His intermediary. The prophets know God, but how is more than our human minds can grasp? We believe we attain in the next world to seeing the prophets. So in this quote, the Shoghi Effendi again tells us, that we always come to know God, even in the next world, through an intermediary, through one of his prophets of God. Indeed, were all the inhabitants of earth and heaven, and whatever existeth between them, to assemble together, they would utterly fail and be powerless to produce such a book, even though we made them masters of eloquence and learning on earth. Since thou dost adduce proofs from the Koran, God shall, with proofs from that self-same book, vindicate himself in the Bayan, the Bob's book. This is none other than a decree of God. He is truly the all-knowing, the all-powerful. If thou art of them that truly believe, thou hast no other alternative than to bear allegiance unto it. This is the way of God for all the inhabitants of earth and heaven, and all that lieth betwixt them. In this quote from the Bab, he says this individual is producing proofs from the Quran, and God shall, with proofs from that self-same book, vindicate himself in the Bayan. So the previous dispensation is being used as a justification and rationale for the truth of the subsequent revelation. For example, using the New Testament to testify to the prophethood of uh, Prophet Muhammad, or using the Old Testament to testify, for example, to the truth of Jesus Christ. And in this case, it says this is the way of God for all the inhabitants of earth and heaven, and all that lieth between them. So these manifestations of God, appearing in each of the worlds of God, as a vehicle for the transmission of the grace of God and of divinity itself, where these different layers have blocked our view of the greater reality that we are in, there must needs be a being who will actually manifest and share that message to all the worlds of God. The truth of that most recent message is being demonstrated through a previous dispensation 
and this is the way in every world of God. Listen to this passage from the long obligatory prayer. Make my prayer, O my Lord, a fountain of living waters, whereby I may live as long as thy sovereignty endureth, and may make mention of thee in every world of thy worlds. Here in the long obligatory prayer, uh, those who pray this prayer regularly, it says that you're asking God that you may make mention of thee in every world of thy worlds. There are many prayers like this where we're asking if we can actually declare God's grace and divinity itself in every world of God. The content of this prayer, I believe, is hoping to be able to proclaim the true, most recent faith, the message of that manifestation of God in every world. He wishes you both to convey to your dear mother his heartfelt sympathy on so great a loss, and he feels sure you will both do all in your power to lighten her sorrow. For those who remain behind, death is a hard blow indeed. But for such a soul as your father, it is only a step into a new and glorious life, a life of freedom to be near the eternal beloved and to serve the cause of God in those realms of height he has passed to. Your father's constant prayer was that you both should serve the cause of God, and the guardian is confident that you will carry out his wishes and thus bring joy to his spirit. He will surely be always watching over you now, closer even than he was in life, and seeking to guide and help you. You could find no better path in life than to follow in his footsteps and live up to his example. I loved him very much, for he was delightful to converse with, and as a companion second to none. One night not long ago, I saw him in the world of dreams. Although his frame had always been massive, in the dream world he appeared larger and more corpulent than ever. It seemed as if he had returned from a journey. I said to him, Jinab, you have grown good and stout. Yes, he answered. Praise be to God. I have been in places where the air was fresh and sweet, and the water crystal pure. The landscapes were beautiful to look upon, the foods delectable. It all agreed with me, of course, so I am stronger than ever now, and I have recovered the zest of my early youth. The breasts of the all-merciful blew over me, and all my time was spent in telling of God. I have been setting forth his proofs and teaching his faith. The meaning of teaching the faith in the next world is spreading the sweet saviors of holiness. That action is the same as teaching. We spoke together a little more, and then some people arrived, and he disappeared. In this first quote uh, from The Guardian, we hear that an individual who has passed into the realms above, and he is actually serving the cause somehow there. Um, and then in the second passage from Memorials of the Faithful, we hear of Mullah Ali Akbar and Abdul Baha communicating that this individual in the realms beyond, who has passed beyond, is setting forth, setting forth his proofs and teaching the faith. Meaning, in the worlds beyond, as we've seen, we individuals will not know that they were wrong. They will not have a full awareness of the truth. So teaching and demonstration and proving from the prior revelation, or prior revelations, I think we will see, is actually being carried on in all the worlds of God. That is why the development that we take care of in this life, which necessitates service, teaching, faith, assurance, setting forth proofs, the development of all these virtues, are truly and genuinely vital for each of the worlds of God. Because in each of those worlds of God, there is a manifestation sent down. One who I think we will see, we actually will need to find again. So this next section we call Detached from All the Worlds Beyond. The cause of God hath come as a token of his grace. Happy are they who act, 
Happy are they who understand. Happy the man that hath clung unto the truth, detached from all that is in the heavens and all that is on earth. Indeed, shouldst thou desire to confer blessing upon a servant, thou wouldst blot out from the realm of his heart every mention or disposition except thine own mention. And shouldst thou ordain evil for a servant by reason of that which his hands have unjustly wrought before thy face, thou wouldst test him with the benefits of this world and of the next, that he might become preoccupied therewith and forget thy remembrance. In the first quote we listen to, it states that happy the man that hath clung unto the truth, detached from all that is in heaven and all that is on earth. So there is a necessity for the true happiness of, an, of a soul. One must be detached from the worlds beyond. In the second, it says that if God wished to actually ordain evil for a servant, by reason of that which his hands have unjustly wrought, what would he do? He would test him with the benefits of this world and the next. So there are benefits and bounties in the next world that in the first quote we have to be detached from. We hear in this quote from the Bob that the benefits and the beauties and wonders of the world beyond, or I would add, of the worlds beyond, can themselves be a test which can ensnare a soul and keep him from the truth. Yeah, the seeker reacheth a station wherein that which hath been ordained for him knoweth no bounds. The fire of love so blazeth in his heart that it seizeth the reins of constraint from his grasp. At every moment his love for his Lord increaseth and draweth him nearer unto his Creator, in such wise that if his Lord be in the east of nearness, and he dwell in the west of remoteness, and possess all that earth and heaven contain of rubies and gold, he would forsake it all and rush forth to the land of the desired one. In this quote it's talking about how a true seeker, a true servant, can reach a place where the fire of love blazeth so much in their heart that it seizes the reins of constraint, and all that is in heaven and on earth of rubies and gold, he would push them aside. Once again, this notion that in the worlds beyond, there are beauties and wonders, just like in this world, that can attract our attention and draw us away from the true goal of that domain. And remember, in that domain, there is going to be a message from God in the form of a manifestation of God. And all around will be these, if you will, the analogy being landscapes of things that can draw our attention away from him. I swear by the truth of God, wert thou to know that which I know, thou wouldst forgo the sovereignty of this world and of the next, that thou mightest attain my good pleasure through thine obedience unto the true one. He's, the Bob is telling us that if we could see with his eyes, if we could know what he knows, that we would forego the sovereignty of this world and of the next. That in some sense it itself can actually be, once again, a trap, a snare, something that can draw us away from our true purpose in that world of God. If any man were to arise to defend in his writings the cause of God against his assailants, such a man, however inconsiderable his share, shall be so honored in the world to come that the concourse on high would envy his glory. No pen can depict the loftiness of his station, neither can any tongue describe its splendor. For whosoever standeth firm and steadfast in this holy, this glorious and exalted revelation, such power shall be given him as to enable him to face and withstand all that is in heaven and on earth. In this quote, Baha'u'llah is talking about the bounties and beauty of an individual who would stand up and actually defend the cause of God against those who would attack it. And he says that and such a soul would actually be given power that would enable him to withstand 
all that is in heaven and on earth. And once again, the same theme about why we would have to withstand something in heaven. And it says all those, as if, you will, there was in that world beyond individuals who were not in agreement that you would actually have to give proofs and arguments and teach. But this is exactly what we saw in the case of Mullah Ali Akbar, that there is teaching going on in the worlds beyond, adducing proofs from a prior revelation as we ascend through all the worlds of God, through all these revelations of God. And in this case, we are actually praying in all of these prayers to be able to make mention of God in each of these worlds, to defend his cause in each of these worlds, to have faith and assurance in each of these worlds. That we are really looking at a picture where we can, as we've seen, be in a hell in any world of God. One of the first uh, sections we did on this evening was looking about how there actually is a heaven and hell in every world of God. That heaven and hell being defined as exception or rejection of the manifestation of God. We see now that that manifestation of God is in each of the worlds, which is why you can have a heaven or a hell in each world. We also have these prayers where we're asking to be released from attachment to the worlds into which we are entering. Such is my love for thee that I can fear no one, though the powers of all the worlds be arrayed against me. Alone and unaided I have, by the power of thy might, arisen to proclaim thy cause, unafraid of the host of my oppressors. I swear by God, I seek no earthly goods from thee, be it as much as a mustard seed. Indeed, to possess anything of this world or of the next world would, in my estimation, be tantamount to open blasphemy. For it ill beseemeth the believer in the unity of God to turn his gaze to aught else, much less to hold it in his possession. In this first quote from the Prayers and Meditations of Baha'u'llah, he says that he fears no one because of his love for God, though the powers of all the worlds be arrayed against me. That once again there can be powers arrayed against you in the worlds beyond. That you can, again, be teaching and inducing proofs. In the second one it says, Indeed, to possess anything of this world or of the next would, in my estimation, be tantamount to blasphemy. Why? Because a believer in the unity of God would not turn his gaze to aught else. So all around there are these, again from the quotes, these images of rubies and gold, these exquisite places that we're moving through these many different valleys that we're actually traveling through, and all within them are these delectable fruits and wonderful things that we can be drawn towards. Yet they themselves can actually be distractions, even though some of those distractions being the arguments or perspectives of other individuals in those worlds, but that our job is to defend, adduce proofs like Mullah Ali Akbar, not be attracted to all these things, pray for detachment from that world, just as we pray for detachment to this world, and seek out the manifestation of God in that world. And remember, as we previously uh, read, we must be wary because God may test us with the benefits of this world and of the next. In the words of the Bob. Indeed, shouldst thou desire to confer blessing upon a servant, thou wouldst blot out from the realm of his heart every mention or disposition except thine own mention. And shouldst thou ordain evil for a servant by reason of that which his hands have unjustly wrought before thy face, thou wouldst test him with the benefits of this world and of the next, that he might become preoccupied therewith and forget thy remembrance. So this next section is the world and the life to come defined. Know ye that by the world is meant your unawareness of him who is your maker, and your absorption in aught else but him. The life to come, on the other hand, signifieth the things that give you a safe approach to God, the all-glorious, the incomparable. Whatsoever deterreth you in this day from loving God is nothing but the world. Flee it, that ye may be numbered with the blessed. 
Should a man wish to adorn himself with the ornaments of the earth, to wear its apparels, or partake of the benefits it can bestow, no harm can befall him, if he alloweth nothing whatever to intervene between him and God. For God hath ordained every good thing, whether created in the heavens or in the earth, for such of his servants as truly believe in him. Eat ye, O people, of the good things which God hath allowed you, and deprive not yourselves from his wondrous bounties. Baha'u'llah defines the world as what? Your unawareness of him who is your maker. And the absorption in anything but him. And the life to come, on the other hand, it says, signifieth the things that give you a safe approach to God. Baha'u'llah then goes, very clearly states, that these beauties in each of the world of God are meant for your adornment. They're meant for your enjoyment. The wonders of this world are meant to be enjoyed. And they should be, as long as they alloweth nothing whatever to intervene between oneself and their God. And that every good thing that he hath ordained in every world of God is actually for this purpose. Simply that the world in any world of God you're in is defined as that which draws you away, that which can actually distract you, that which can become more of a focus than the true, the good, the just, and the beautiful, and that the life to come signifieth the things that give you a safe approach. So when we are fulfilling in our life that which draws us closer to God, that is the life to come. That is heaven. Whenever we are turning away, that is hell. And what is those things that is that true safe approach to God, that given that there is no direct intercourse, um, it is the manifestation of God in every world of God. That we can, uh, again, as the Bob said, ascend through these revelations, through the worlds of God, by seeking out his messengers, finding their, their message, and then embodying that which would be our heaven. Or turning away should we choose, and if distracted, and attached to that which is in the world beyond, which becomes the world, or hell. This next section is called Finding Him, Smelling His Fragrance. And we begin with a quote from Baha'u'llah. Blessed is the man that hath acknowledged his belief in God and in his signs, and recognized that he shall not be asked of his doings. Such a recognition hath been made by God, the ornament of every belief, and its very foundation. Upon it must depend the acceptance of every goodly deed. Such is the teaching which God bestoweth on you, a teaching that will deliver you from all manner of doubt and perplexity, and enable you to attain unto salvation in both this world and in the next. In this passage, Baha'u'llah is telling us that we should acknowledge God and in his signs, and recognize that he shall not be asked of his doings. That he does not, if you will, have to conform to what we think he should do. And that somehow that this is the very foundation upon which our belief must be built. And that this will deliver us from doubt and enable us to attain salvation in both this world and the next. And it's really important here because it's saying there's a way that you attain salvation here and cannot attain salvation in the next world. And I would suggest if we look back through many of the studies we've done before, this can be vice versa. You can not attain salvation in this world, but you can make up for lost opportunities. You can actually find the manifestation of God in the next world, even when you did not hear. We were told this explicitly, and we've looked at this in previous studies. But here, what we're actually being told is we have to be very, very careful about how we might quickly judge a message from God. How we might quickly reject a message from God in the next world. And again, remember, it'll, it may enable you to attain salvation in this world and the next. So we could have found salvation, moved into the next world, and because we have not truly understood how God can manifest himself within each of these worlds, we actually can reject in the next world, and thus end up in hell. Say, from my laws the sweet-smelling Savior of my garment can be smelled, and by their aid the standards of victory will be planted upon the highest peaks. 
The tongue of my power hath, from the heaven of my omnipotent glory, addressed to my creation these words. Observe my commandments for the love of my beauty. Happy is the lover that hath inhaled the divine fragrance of his best beloved from these words, laden with the perfume of a grace which no tongue can describe. By my life, he who hath drunk the choice wine of fairness from the hands of my bountiful favor will circle around my commandments that shine above the dayspring of my creation. The sweet-smelling savior of my garment, number four. This is an allusion to the story of Joseph in the Quran and the Old Testament, in which Joseph's garment brought by his brothers to Jacob, their father, enabled Jacob to identify his beloved long-lost son. The metaphor of the fragrant garment is frequently used in the Baha'i writings to refer to the recognition of the manifestation of God and his revelation. Baha'u'llah, in one of his tablets, describes himself as the divine Joseph, who has been bartered away by the heedless for the most paltry of prices. The Bab, in the Kayumul Asma, identifies Baha'u'llah as the true Joseph and forecasts the ordeals that he would endure at the hands of his treacherous brother. Likewise, Shoghi Effendi draws a parallel between the intense jealousy which the preeminence of Abdu'l-Baha has aroused in his half-brother, Mirza Muhammad Ali, and the deadly envy which the superior excellence of Joseph has kindled in the hearts of his brothers. So in this quote from the Most Holy Book, Baha'u'llah says that from his laws, we can actually inhale the divine fragrance of the blessed beloved. So from his teachings, we can actually smell the fragrance of God through them. This is a, an allusion, as we see, to actually the story of Joseph, um, in which the garment is brought to Jacob, and he actually smells it, and he can smell his son. And the fragrant garment refers to, as we're seeing from the notes from the Katabi Akdas, um, to refer to the recognition of the manifestation of God and his revelation. It's important to recognize this. Um, for now, we're going to move on to another quote, which actually comes from the Book of Certitude. I swear by God, Were he that treadeth the path of guidance, and seeketh to scale the heights of righteousness, to attain unto this glorious and supreme station, he would inhale at a distance of a thousand leagues the fragrance of God, and would perceive the resplendent morn of a divine guidance, rising above the dayspring of all things. Each and every thing, however small, would be to him a revelation, leading him to his beloved, the object of his quest. So great shall be the discernment of this seeker, that he will discriminate between truth and falsehood, even as he doth distinguish the sun from shadow. If in the uttermost corners of the east the sweet saviors of God be wafted, he will assuredly recognize and inhale their fragrance, even though he be dwelling in the uttermost ends of the west. He will likewise clearly distinguish all the signs of God, his wondrous utterances, his great works and mighty deeds, from the doings, words, and ways of men, even as the jeweler who knoweth the gem from the stone, or the man who distinguisheth the spring from autumn and heat from cold. When the channel of the human soul is cleansed of all worldly and impending attachments, It will unfailingly perceive the breath of the Beloved across immeasurable distances, and will, led by its perfume, attain and enter the city of certitude. Therein he will discern the wonders of his ancient wisdom, and will perceive all the hidden teachings from the rustling leaves of the tree, which flourisheth in that city. With both his inner and his outer ear, he will hear from its dust the hymns of glory and praise, ascending unto the Lord of Lords. And with his inner eye will he discover the mysteries of return and revival. How unspeakably glorious are the signs, the tokens, the revelations, and splendors, which he who is the king of names and attributes hath destined for that city. The attainment of this city quencheth thirst without water, 
and kindleth the love of God without fire. Within every blade of grass are enshrined the mysteries of an inscrutable wisdom, and upon every rose bush a myriad nightingales pour out, in blissful rapture, their melody. Its wondrous tulips unfold the mystery of the undying fire in the burning bush, and its sweet saviors of holiness breathe the perfume of the messianic spirit. It bestoweth wealth without gold, and conferreth immortality without death. In every leaf ineffable delights are treasured, and within every chamber unnumbered mysteries lie hidden. This quote itself is actually just such an exquisite one uh, for me, because it gives all these different images of what a seeker can attain. Um, and it's important because it says the seeker, if they actually really, really, truly develop themselves, as it said, if he scale the heights of righteousness and attain unto the glorious and supreme station. So this is obviously an extremely exalted, if you will, station of being, degree of progress. At such a stage, if, if, if you will, the, the senses are actually cleared of the self, of the world, <laughs> Uh, we could inhale at a distance of a thousand leagues the fragrance of God. But what is that fragrance of God? That fragrance of God is his teachings. And the smelling of that garment, the, the inhaling of that fragrance, is actually finding the manifestation of God. It's then saying, if in the uttermost corners of the East the sweet savors of God be wafted, he will assuredly recognize and inhale their fragrance, even though he be dwelling in the uttermost ends of the West. We see that such an individual if they scale the heights of righteousness and attain the supreme station, that they can actually distinguish the signs of God from the doings, the words, and the ways of men, even as the jeweler who knoweth the gem from the stone. Unfailingly perceive the breath of God across immeasurable distances. That this is the supreme station that an individual is trying to actually achieve I'm going to propose, if we actually read it, throughout the worlds of God, to reach a, such a station of refinement, such a station of actual sanctification, burning with the fire of the love of God, that they can actually inhale this fragrance from far away and find that manifestation of God. Because in each of the worlds of God, there is a manifestation of God waiting. There is a heaven, there is a hell. There is a series of things that can test us and draw us away. So we have to develop the senses. Again, this right back to the beginning, this concept of, of the embryo, the ability to develop the eyes, the ears, and the nose, the sense of taste, and the sense of actually mobility, the different virtues that enable us to do what? To move within the realms of God. Some of those things we have to develop being faith and assurance the ability to discern the signs of God. This is the fragrance we're trying to truly be able to discern as quickly as we can in our process of evolution to the worlds of God. Help them then, O God, to reach forth through the power of thy sovereign might towards such a station that they can readily distinguish every foul smell from the fragrance of the raiment of him who is the bearer of the most lofty and exalted name, that they may turn with all their affections toward thee, and may enjoy such intimate communion with thee, that if all that is in heaven and on earth were given them, they would regard it as unworthy of their notice, and would refuse to cease from remembering thee, and from extolling thy virtues. It's really the same theme once again. It's that there is a station that we can actually reach where, quote, we can readily distinguish every foul smell from the fragrance of the raiment of him who is the bearer of thy most lofty and exalted name. And this, in this very quote, it actually says, And they may enjoy such intimate communion with thee that if all that is in heaven and on earth were given them, they would regard it as unworthy. So, if in the heavens above, in the worlds beyond, all those metaphorically rubies and gold were offered to you, you would actually smell the foul smell from the fragrance and separate that from the fragrance of the raiment of the manifestation of God, the divine Joseph, the one you need to find in that world of God. I entreat thee by the fragrances of the raiment of thy grace, 
which at thy bidding and in conformity with thy desire were diffused throughout the entire creation. I testify that through him the pen of the Most High was set in motion, and with his remembrance the scriptures in the kingdom of names were embellished. Through him the fragrances were wafted, and the sweet smell of thy raiment was shed abroad amongst all the dwellers of the earth and the inmates of heaven. So in this first quote, we actually see that the, the fragrances of the raiment of God's grace, that raiment, that robe, being the analogy for the manifestation of God, were diffused throughout the entire creation. And then it says uh, that through him the pen of the Most High was set in motion, and with his remembrance the scriptures in the kingdom of names were embellished and that the fragrance were wafted amongst all the dwellers of earth and the inmates of heaven. And I was just, again, if we look at these, these texts closely, this is because the fragrance of the manifestation was actually wafted throughout all the worlds of God, and in all those worlds of God there are scriptures upon which their names are embellished. That these are that which we are seeking, which sorts between whether or not we are in the hell of that world or the heaven of that world. And it is this capacity that we are seeking to actually discern through our ascent to the divine blood. This next quote simply tells us that it is the fragrance that we actually derive from the manifestation of God that we then can actually spread unto others in all the worlds of God. Empower them also, O my God, to be as the rain that poureth down from the clouds of thy grace and as the winds that waft the vernal fragrances of thy loving kindness, that through them the soil of the hearts of thy creatures may be clad with verdure, and may bring forth the things that will shed their fragrance over all thy dominion, so that everyone may perceive the sweet smell of the robe of thy revelation. Once again, this is like in the story of Mullah Ali Akbar, when he is spreading the fragrances of God, or some of the quotes that we've seen about individuals teaching in the worlds beyond, they're spreading the fragrances. It is that fragrance that we get from the manifestation of God in that world, that musked scent that we actually then take on and then spread through. And that is actually the job to be a lamp unto others, to actually be uh, that which actually enables them, and through learning ourselves, to discern the fragrance of the Beloved from a thousand leagues away. This is why we are told in the Most Holy Book, Consort with all religions with amity and concord, that they may inhale from you the sweet fragrance of God. So why is it that we consort with individuals of all faiths? Because in my understanding, according to the Baha'i writings, once we have gone through the Valley of Search, once we have actually sought out the Divine Beloved, and we actually get that sweet-smelling savor, that fragrance from his laws and from his person, we then, if we, if we embody his teachings, if we truly move into layers, if you will, of higher heavens, of subtleties, of seeking the greatest expression of his teachings, that fragrance comes off us unto others and enables them to, if they are actually open to it, smelling that fragrance and running towards him. And that that in itself enables us to more deeply understand him and in such a way be able to find him in the worlds beyond. It is this topic of finding the manifestation of God in every world that gives us our definition, I believe, of what we really mean by everlasting life. Thus, spirituality is the greatest of God's gifts, and life everlasting means turning to God. It is something that actually stands out uh, interestingly, even within much of the Judeo-Christian scriptures, it will say that uh, one is giving everlasting life, right? Or given eternal life. Yet in such pictures, often there is uh, a problem we will look at in the future, uh, seemingly an eternality of hell. So life cannot mean continued existence. Uh, if hell were eternal, if you're a Christian or if you're a Muslim, um, it, it, it itself cannot mean uh, meaning everlasting life cannot mean actually just everlasting existence. It necessarily means some different concept of life. And we were just looking at a quote recently of the life to come is that which secures 
our safe passage to the Beloved. That is finding his fragrance. That is actually finding that vehicle for the transmission of his grace and of divinity itself in all the worlds of God. That uh, his message being sent down in all the worlds of God in the form of a prophet. And this is the thing is that, again, I believe <laughs> that when we look at the concept of everlasting life within the writings, what is that? It is that prayer that we are making in the long obligatory prayer, that we might make mention of him in every world of his worlds, that we might be able, through the development of our spiritual capacities, our virtues, our seeking him to find that divine being, that divine messenger, in each of the worlds of God. An analogy that often comes uh, to mind when I think about these things is actually the finding of a loved one in a different place. I remember once I was actually in my hometown and I was walking across the bridge. I went over a large river in my hometown and it was nighttime actually. And I was actually crossing over just the crest of the bridge and several hundred yards away, uh, I looked over and I said, oh, there's my friend Dave. And now this was Dave. But I reflected on it. I said, well, how strange is that? Because this individual is several hundred yards away. How did I know that this was my friend? I can't see his face. And it was because I could see the way he walked. Because I was so used to being around this friend of mine that I got to know just the way he walked. It makes me think, if you will, of Qudus seeing the Bab walking through the market of Shiraz, where suddenly he saw, this is a being that I know, in that case being a divine recognition. And I think often, um, say for example, I'm trying to actually find a friend of mine, and I know this individual very, very intimately. I know his ways. I know his loves his cares. I know the things he likes to do, the things he likes to eat. I've become, if you will, enamored with this friend of mine and the realities of his person. Well, if you were to actually take me and say it's my friend Shahruz, my friend who actually does the cutting of these videos, say my friend Shahruz is actually suddenly somewhere in Beijing and I actually have to find him. And you don't know Shahruz and you have to find him. And we have a race to see who can actually discover uh, where Sharos is, I was just obviously I'm going to win. I can know the ways he walks. I can see in my mind's eye the places that he might go, the kinds of concerts he might go to, whether or not he would go to a museum or not, if we would go to a dance show, and I can begin scouring that massive city <laughs> for this dear friend of mine because I know his ways. And this is the thing, is, is I, I believe if we really reflect on what actually is the process of what we are supposed to do here within this life, which is to read the Word of God, to express His virtues, His attributes in our own life, we begin to see more and more that we smell His fragrance. That we actually, when we look at the Scriptures and see what the mind of the Divine Being is like, we can really come up with a different, if you will, a rich, rich picture of what this being is like so that when we move into the next world, we can find him again. This is one of the reasons why I believe it's so um, vital to actually recognize the manifestation of God in his most recent expression. For example, I myself read the New Testament. I read the Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible. I read the Quran. I read the Buddhist writings. I read the Hindu writings all through the lens, of course, of, of being a Baha'i and reading the writings of the Bab and of Shoghi Effendi and of Abdu'l Baha, there is constantly an, an enrichment of, if you will, the fragrance and the character of this divine being. How this divine being manifests itself within this realm. And yet, what have we seen when, when we move into the next world and the next world? and the next world, and the next world, there will be his fragrance somewhere in that world, and we will have to find him. For as we know, there is a manifestation of God in each world, there is a heaven and a hell, and we can become attached to the world that we're in. The following quote brings up a question. These verses of the Torah have therefore numerous meanings. We will explain one of them, and will say that by Adam, is meant the spirit of Adam, and by Eve is meant his self. For in certain passages of the sacred scriptures where women are mentioned, the intended meaning is the human self. By the tree of good and evil, 
is meant the material world. For the heavenly realm of the spirit is pure goodness and absolute radiance. But in the material world, light and darkness, good and evil, and all manner of opposing realities are to be found. As to the second question, the tests and trials of God take place in this world, not in the world of the kingdom. So in these two quotes, um, there seems to be a problem, <laughs> uh, put simply, because it seems to say that the tree of the good and evil, in the first quote, is meant the material world, for the heavenly realm of the spirit is pure goodness. Uh, but the material world is light and darkness, good and evil, and these opposing realities. And then in the second quote from Selections and Writings of Abdu'l-Bahá, it says, uh, the tests and trials of God take place in this world, not in the world of the kingdom. So we generally have some work to do. Why? Because listen to the following quote. In regard to your question concerning evil spirits and their influence upon souls, Shoghi Effendi wishes me to inform you that what is generally called evil spirit is a purely imaginary creation and has no reality whatever. But as to evil, there is no doubt that it exerts a very strong influence both in this world and in the next. Abdu'l-Bahá, in some answered questions, gives us a thorough and true analysis of the problem of evil. You should preferably refer to that book for further explanation on that point. And it seems, clearly, in the Selections and Writings of Abdu'l-Bahá, he says the tests and trials of God take place in this world, not in the world of the kingdom. As well, we have a, if you will, almost a countertext, where the Guardian himself is stating that evil exists both in this world and in the next, and exerts a strong influence. So we seem to have, if you will, a conundrum of a series of texts that seem to balance off each other and cause, you know what I mean, almost a tension. What is happening? Well, we did actually read a quote just recently where the world, where the opposing realities exist, is defined as whatever actually draws us away from the divine. And the life to come is whatever actually pulls us and secures our safe journey towards the divine. So in the world of the kingdom, possibly one conception is, is that in the life to come, which is the teachings of the manifestation of God, there are no tests and trials we can actually advance towards. Whereas the world itself, where you have these opposing realities, is those aspects of the domain and state, state of existence that we're in that can actually draw us away. As well, we have an issue that might arise as we continue on, which is there seems not to be one single concept or structure, if you will, in the worlds beyond. There is uh, what is often termed Malakut, the realms, if you will, of the angels, and there is such a thing called Jabrut, which is the realm of power. What I believe is usually referred to as the Crimson Arc, or for example, the Kingdom. That there are stages of reality that one can, but not necessarily will, achieve and attain within one's journey back to the divine. But we'll have to wait on this for a little couple more quotes to come. The two heavens or earth, heaven and that which lieth in between. All praise be unto thee, O God. Thou art the maker of the heavens and the earth, and that which is between them. And thou in truth art the supreme ruler, the fashioner, the all-wise. Glorified art thou, O God. Thou art the creator of the heavens and the earth, and that which lieth between them. Thou art the sovereign Lord, the most holy, the almighty, the all-wise. We will no doubt do a study of the themes that actually arise in this section uh, much more deeply in the future. But what we can see is that there is, in these two quotes from the Bahab, there is the heavens, the earth, and that which lieth between them. As I said, you often encounter concepts of the inmates of the all-highest paradise, or for example, the companions of the Crimson Ark. Um, we seem to have, I think unequivocally, uh, series of structures or stations within the next world beyond. And there is that which lieth in between heaven, the heaven of kingdom and earth. 
This is, I believe, when we look at certain concepts within the Baha'i writings surrounding the Kingdom, the Crimson Ark, the All Highest Paradise, and those who will circle around thy mighty throne, we find that there is those things which in many different faiths actually correspond to what we would call Nirvana, or Moksha in Hinduism. That true heaven, if you will, the true, true heaven, those divine realms far above the normal worlds of God beyond this. Uh, in Buddhism, I believe, you start really getting into this when you start looking at what are called the dhyanas, the realm of infinite space, the realm of infinite consciousness, emptiness, and the realms of neither perception nor non-perception. Again, a theme we will look at in the future. It's that you're looking at these, this world that you're in now, in this truly, truly rarefied area, which is the ultimate goal and purpose of human existence. One that we can only begin to crack open and understand when we begin to study Baha'i cosmology, the structures of the realms of reality beyond this one. And that it's in this kingdom, the world of the kingdom, the kingdom of revelation, that there are no tests and trials at the very end. Whereas in the many worlds in between, we actually do have to pray for detachment from even what is in those worlds, and we actually have to adduce proofs, as Mullah Ali Akbar did. We actually have to seek out the Divine Being, the manifestations of God, in those worlds beyond. It is in this uh, most highest heaven, the Kingdom of Revelation, as opposed to the Kingdom of Creation, that we actually truly hear of meeting the Prophets of God. This quote is from Baha'u'llah. Blessed is the soul which at the hour of its separation from the body, is sanctified from the vain imaginings of the peoples of the world. Such a soul liveth and moveth in accordance with the will of its Creator, and entereth the all-highest paradise. The maids of heaven, inmates of the loftiest mansions, will circle around it, and the prophets of God and His chosen ones will seek its companionship. With them that soul will freely converse, and will recount unto them that which it hath been made to endure in the path of God, the Lord of all worlds." Again, we're talking about, it seems self-evident, a very, very rarefied soul. Someone who is sanctified from the vain imaginings of all the people of the world. A being that liveth and moveth in accordance with the will of its Creator that the will of its Creator really is the essence of this person. And they enter what? They enter what is called the All-Highest Paradise. There, and the inmates of the loftiest mansion, the maids of heaven, then come out, and they will, what? Seek his companionship. That they will freely converse and recount what they have been made to do, made to endure in the path of God. So there is a place in the All-Highest Paradise, in the All-Highest Kingdom, where a being can reach a station which I believe we will see is the ultimate goal of human existence. To get to a place where the testing and trials of God in the realm of discerning His manifestations has actually ceased. This is in the All-Highest Paradise when in the final stage we recount that which we have been made to endure in the path of God. Such pictures are insanely rich <laughs> within the Bai writings, and there are hundreds and hundreds of passages scattered throughout the writings that relate to this, if you will, crimson arc that we can actually enter. And we will look at those in the future. One thing we do know is that we will, in the worlds beyond, have the ability to attain to this experience of seeing the prophets of God. Here from Shoghi Effendi. We will have experience of God's Spirit through His prophets in the next world. But God is too great for us to know without His intermediary. The prophets know God. But how is more than our human minds can grasp? We believe we attain in the next world to seeing the prophets. This next quote is a quote from the World Order of Baha'u'llah. It is something that we will actually have to hold off for studies in cosmology, the realms and stations of all the world beyond. But for now it's important to actually hear it. This is Shoghi Effendi from the World Order Baha'u'llah. In confirmation of the exalted rank of the true believer, referred to by Baha'u'llah, 
he reveals the following. The station which he who has truly recognized this revelation will attain is the same as the one ordained for such prophets of the house of Israel as are not regarded as manifestations endowed with constancy. He is telling us that one who hath truly recognized will attain the station for the prophets of the house of Israel as are not regarded as manifestations endowed with constancy. We will once again have to look, wait, sorry, for a deeper study of this subject. But these, I would suggest, is what we call the lesser prophets, which themselves have a unity, as we will see within the writings of Shoghi Effendi, and that the ultimate destiny of an individual is to attain the station of, again, such prophets of Israel that are not endowed with constancy, the lesser prophets that we see within the Old Testament. I believe it is only here which I believe we can see through the writings of the Buddha and through the Hindu writings that this is the real state of Nirvana, the real state of Moksha, or the Fana al-Fana, <laughs> the extinction of extinction in Islam, where a being finally attains their ultimate destiny. But once again, we will have to wait for a future lecture to actually explore this more deeply. Know thou of a truth that the soul, after its separation from the body, will continue to progress until it attaineth the presence of God, in a state and condition which neither the revolution of ages and centuries, nor the changes and chances of this world, can alter. It will endure as long as the kingdom of God, his sovereignty, his dominion, and power will endure. So in this quote, we're told a very peculiar thing. <laughs> One that we're going to progress until it attaineth the presence of God in a state and condition which neither the revolution of ages and centuries nor the changes and chances of this world can alter. So we progress through, and at the same time there is a static nature that is actually happening. Because it actually cannot be changed the revelations, revolution of ages and centuries, nor the changes and chances of this world. But it will endure as long as the kingdom of God. What is happening here, I believe again, is that we're looking at the process in the next world where the soul takes on, as we are told in the writings, a body. A body commensurate with a degree of sanctity, of service, of love and sacrifice, and of seeking him that we have actually done in this life. That soul is embodied in the next world. And that world that he comes into or she comes into within that body, that is the body that is used to actually seek out the divine. And nothing of the ages of centuries and turning of time or the changes and chances of this world can't change that. But that itself seeks the divine being in that realm, in that vehicle. Whether or not they actually develop, we know that there is an infinite series of worlds of gods, sorry, worlds of God, and that what one achieves within this world or the world right beyond is actually what gives us the body for the next. If you will, the image of our true spirit is reflected in our own mirror all throughout the different worlds of God. That that body, that image that we are given is in accordance with what we had done in a previous world and either allows us to better or prevents us from doing as much as we could in finding the divine being in that world. This is the process of our journey back to God, which actually enables us to actually express our own free will, do as we choose. Yet at the same time, the judgment is the body that we're given, that body that we're given with the sense organs of that baby coming out of each of these fetuses, actually enables that being to move throughout that world of God and, if you will, either benefits or handicaps them in their capacity to actually find the divine being, that manifestation in each of the worlds of God. This is why, in some sense, there's a staticness to each world of God, but there is a constant progress all the way through. You have asked why it was necessary for the soul that was from God 
to make this journey back to God? Would you like to understand the reality of this question just as I teach it? Or do you wish to hear it as the world teaches it? For if I should answer you according to the latter way, this would be but imitation and would not make the subject clear. The reality underlining this question is that the evil spirit, Satan, or whatever is interpreted as evil, refers to the lower nature in man. The spacer, the spacer nature is symbolized in various ways. In man there are two expressions. One is the expression of nature, the other the expression of the spiritual realm. The world of nature is defective. Look at it clearly, casting aside all superstition and imagination. If you should leave a man uneducated and barbarous in the wilds of Africa, would there be any doubt about his remaining ignorant? God has never created an evil spirit. All such ideas and nomenclature are symbols expressing the mere human or earthly nature of man. It is an essential condition of the soil of earth that thorns, weeds, and fruitless trees may grow from it. Relatively speaking, this is evil. It is simply the lower state and baser product of nature. It is evident, therefore, that man is in need of divine education and inspiration, that the spirit and bounties of God are essential to his development. That is to say, the teachings of Christ and the prophets are necessary for his education and guidance. Why? Because they are the divine gardeners who till the earth of human hearts and minds. They educate man, uproot the weeds, burn the thorns, and remodel the waste places into gardens and orchards where fruitful trees grow. The wisdom and purpose of their training is that man must pass from degree to degree of progressive unfoldment until perfection is attained. For instance, if a man should live his entire life in one city, he cannot gain a knowledge of the whole world. To become perfectly informed, he must visit other cities, see the mountains and valleys, cross the rivers, and traverse the plains. In other words, without progressive and universal education, perfection will not be attained. Man must walk in many paths and be subjected to various processes in his evolution upward. Physically, he is not born in full stature, but passes through consecutive stages of fetus, infant, childhood, youth, maturity, and old age. Suppose he had the power to remain young throughout his life. He then would not realize the meaning of old age and could not believe it existed. If he could not realize the condition of old age, he would not know that he was young. He would not know the difference between young and old without experiencing the old. Unless you have passed through the state of infancy, how would you know this was an infant beside you? If there were no wrong, how would you recognize the right? If it were not for sin, how would you appreciate virtue? If evil deeds were unknown, how could you commend good actions? If sickness did not exist, how would you understand health? Evil is non-existent. It is the absence of good. Sickness is the loss of health, poverty, the lack of riches. When wealth disappears, you are poor. You look within the treasure box, but find nothing there. Without knowledge, there is ignorance. Therefore, Ignorance is simply the lack of knowledge. Death is the absence of life. Therefore, on the one hand, we have existence. On the other, non-existence, negation of our, or absence of existence. Briefly, the journey of the soul is necessary. The pathway of life is the road which leads to divine knowledge and attainment. Without training and guidance, the soul could never progress beyond the conditions of its lower nature, which is ignorant and defective. This final quote in this section of study is a response 
by the Master to this great beyond, this great journey through the great beyond. He tells us that there is this um, lower nature of humankind, and that that lower nature is attached to the world. Remember that world defined by Abdu'l-Baha is that which draws us away. It actually is attached to and seeks and craves, if you will, in the Buddhist notion, those sensory expressions, those sensory delights. So it seeks, this earthly nature of man seeks to do this. And the goal of the journey, and the, really the goal of the entirety of existence, is for us, through the expression of our own volition, to seek out the good, the true, the just, and the beautiful, represented in the manifestations, teachings unto humankind, to seek that out and embody them, and ascend beyond that material world into the life to come. That expression of the divine being which enables us to free ourselves from the fetters of this world. But we are told that it is only through passing from degree, quoting, passing from degree to degree, a progressive unfoldment until perfection is attained. That's our goal, that it's if we would live our entire life in one city, we cannot gain knowledge of the whole world. That it is through our process of really knowing darkness that we understand light, of knowing poverty that we understand wealth. It is through our moving through these different worlds of God that the development of our intellectual emotional and spiritual faculties truly gets to be expressed and tested and strengthened. That it really is, if you will, this wondrous journey placed before every soul to move throughout all the realms of God and freely choose if they wish to seek his fragrance, to find the divine being, or to turn aside. God always allows us, and it is through this journey that we understand all the, if you will, the valleys, the mountains, the rivers, the, and the plains, to explore all the worlds of God and all the fruits of his creation, to more increasingly and increasingly understand the divine being and draw closer to him through his manifestations. This is why he says, unless you pass the state of infancy, how would you know this was an infant beside you? If there were no wrong, how would you recognize the light? If there were no sin, how would you appreciate virtue? And I think we can actually see that throughout all the realms of God, through all these different stages and grades of, of reality, the refinements that we're able to actually make within our craft of living, that uh, quote of that one compilation, the divine art of living, that we actually become, if you will, true musicians of ourselves, and able to really, really express the beautiful art of what it is, through moving through all these different trains, through seeking out the divine, from falling and then getting up again, from making mistakes and then reflecting upon them and developing that this really is the journey of human existence. This is why we have this great beyond, this endless vista of beauty and wonder, and yes, challenges and obstacles to be surmounted.